Greetings, and welcome to another episode of Basically, It's Biblical. Thank you again for joining me, and I welcome you into this study. Let us begin with a prayer. O oh Lord, our God, the Most High Heavenly Host, King of Kings and Lord over all Lords, Father, we love to come before you to listen to your words and to hear your guidance. Lord, we ask that you would enter our hearts, our minds, our emotions, our souls, our bodies complete today and bless us with the anointing from on high. Father, I thank you for another opportunity to come before your throne and we wish, Lord God, that you would open our ears so that we may hear directly from you, O Lord. Father, I wish that all those who are listening would hear your voice, your, be filled with your Holy Spirit, and not just listen to my voice. Lord, I ask that as we read these studies, these scriptures, that you would impart your wisdom and your guidance and your understanding to our minds, erasing all of our carnal, worldly influences and letting only the Holy Spirit guide us in truth. And Father, please remember that there are people who are suffering all sorts of persecutions throughout the world. And I know that you are aware. I know that you hear us. I know that you see us. And I know that you love those who follow you, who worship you in spirit and in truth. So let us be, use us, O oh Lord. Let us be a guide to those who are suffering, persecution, hunger, famine, disease, war, etc. Help us to be a comfort to them with the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to be an anointing and a healing balm to all of those that we meet and greet, that you would send our way so that we would entertain them in the holiness of your scriptures. Father, I ask that in the name of the Most High Messiah, Yahusha, that you would just pull us in to your bosom, O oh Lord. Help us to sit at your feet today and just take in all that you would have us to understand. We ask this in the mighty and matchless name of the creator of the universe, he that has made all things, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, his son, the Messiah, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Welcome again. Welcome again, folks. I, I so appreciate your involvement. And I want to just make sure that we um, uh, just kind of recap where we ended off in part one uh, of the Holy Spirit, uh, as we talked about a couple of weeks ago, who and what is the Holy Spirit. And we covered a lot of uh, scriptures there. Um, and I suggested that you read, of course, Romans chapter one, Romans chapter eight, and I gave many other scriptures, but I'll, let me just recap some of those uh, for you uh, if you did not get them. Uh, so we started off, I think, in uh, Acts 19, uh, verses one through five. We covered John one and 33, uh, John 14 and 17, first Corinthians. 3, 1 through 16, we talked about what is the role of the Holy Spirit within the body of the Messiah, within the body of the church. So uh, we did mention at that time, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 6 and 7, uh, Psalm 51. And additionally, uh, there were some others uh, at that time. Uh, I think we also covered uh, 
in particular of Psalms 51 verses 10 through 14, John 15 and 26, and there again was uh, Romans chapter 8. But I also want to add here uh, as well another selection of scriptures to help us to understand more fully uh, uh, the role of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, he, we've talked about him being promised to us, right, by the Messiah. Uh, we also can see that in scripture in Galatians 3, verses 14, in Galatians uh, 3, verse 5, and verse 2. We can see in Galatians chapter 4 and 6 that he was sent and he indwells in us. If, of course, as, as we discussed before, if we're receiving him in faith, uh, he helps us to overcome the carnal, fleshly desires. You know, we talked a lot about that last time um, in terms of our five senses hearing, seeing, you know, taste, smell, those kinds of things, but also in the um, the carnal uh, nature, right? That that the the base animalistic uh, character or portions of us that we each you know have, but that we're hoping to move more toward the spiritual, right? Developing the spiritual man, not so much focused on our um, natural environment, you know, what we can, uh, where we sit, where we eat, what we can see and feel, you know, with those senses, but g transcending beyond the humanness, if you will, and seeking to uh, strengthen our relationship with the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because they are all spirits. And so, you know, it's it's more easy, right? If you, even if you think about it in this world, right? If you want to have an affiliation, it's much easier to have affiliations with those people who are like-minded, right? Or have um, a similar uh, perspective, right? It's easier. It's an easier navigation, easier to communicate. You know, you're not always having to explain what you meant by a word or or a gesture, right? Because they're they're accustomed, you're operating on the same levels and you're accustomed to working together. Well, likewise, uh, in our natural form, you know, in our in our humanness, in this earthly uh dirt body, <laughs> right, that we have, this clay body, uh it, it would be hard to fully appreciate the spiritual realm and the spirits, particularly the Holy Trinity, right? If, uh, since we are bound by this earthly form, you know, much as we talked about many, many, many episodes ago, perhaps even three years ago now, you know, in the very beginning, talking about how if we're focusing uh our understanding on scriptures based on our emotions, for example, or based exclusively on our earthly experience, then it would be easy to come away with misconceptions. So this transformation that we go through when we are first saved and we receive our salvation, we receive our salvation by repenting, et cetera, and we grow more and more uh, in maturity, in our relationship both over time as well as quality, right? Quantity of time spent and the quality of time spent in the presence of the Holy Trinity. Then we transform, right? We're no longer what we used to be and we become the new man, the regenerated man, uh, more closely being aligned with the Holy Trinity the Holy Trinity and their their thoughts, their precepts, their commands, their, it, it, you know, over time it becomes easier, right, to, uh, to, to worship and in spirit and in truth, particularly as it relates to the commandments. We, you know, at the very beginning we may find the commandments to be burdensome, but then over time we, we learn and we understand that these, these commandments 
are like the good shepherd who guides its sheep with its rod and staff, right? Catching them when they're falling, guiding them when they're walking, comforting them in their distress, feeding them and nurturing them in the valley by the rivers of water, right? You get the idea that uh, that uh, at first we might kind of stumble along and at first, you know, we don't like we don't we don't like the correction, but over time we learn the wisdom of that guidance. We spoke about that last week, and then or and and all of that in terms of overcoming the carnal, fleshly, uh, earthly, worldly desires. You know, you especially as you practice um, fasting and prayer, right? And you know, we've talked about that many times before. But as you practice that. Uh, you begin to learn that you do truly have the command that God said we would have. If you practice fasting from, I think last time we spoke about soft drinks, right? Sodas and, or sweets or sugars, uh, you know, any, any kind of those things. If you fast from those uh, elements long enough and often enough, then when, when it's time to take command over it, you find it easier and easier. You know, at first it's, oh, it's a struggle. Give up, <laughs> give up coffee. What? You know, give up, <laughs> give up soda, give up tea. Are you kidding me? Right. Give up sugar. This is, a, this was a hard thing, you know, in the very beginning when you first began uh, this walk, but, but by now, perhaps in your life, you have realized that it's become easier, easier, not just because you as a human have, you know, practiced it and, and and got your uh, how do I want to say your your muscle memory, but also easier because now you have a more complete relationship with the Holy Spirit, a more complete relationship with the Holy Trinity, right? And and the more you have that relationship with the Holy Trinity, the the more you hear their guidance, you feel their guidance, possibly within those five senses, but I mean through the spirit, you know, just um, people talk about having an inkling, right, or intuition, or um, you'll hear people say things like, you know, I, I felt something telling me, or I felt something leading me, or, you know, I got an overwhelming, um, uh, uh, an overwhelming influence to do this or that. Well, we need to name it and declare it, that the Holy Spirit is acting upon us. Otherwise, what are we doing this for, right? Stop giving the credit to, to uh, Mother Nature and, and, and we, give, we give all kinds of credit to, to the devil. But he only has the power that you give him. Amen. Because our father said, resist the devil and he will flee. So if we keep, you know, you keep giving the holy things over to the pigs, right? You don't want to throw your pearls to swine. You don't want to keep giving Satan the credit. You don't want to keep giving the world the credit. Because in fact, the father, the creator is over and above. The entire world as he created it. We need to stop, you know, uh, this this worship or admiration of the creation, the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, the grass, the birds, right, the air, and and start honoring and worshiping and acknowledging where the power truly comes from, the power of relationship and the power in relationship. To the Holy Trinity, the Creator, the Most High God, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know now that in Galatians 5, 16, and 18, it really specifies this uh, issue of overcoming the flesh. And then five verse uh, Galatians 5, Verses 23 to 22, excuse me, through 24, speak to the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
right? Uh, five and Galatians 5 and 5 actually speaks to that issue of patience that we talked about. And then we know in Galatians 6, uh, I believe it's both 8 and 9, uh, we, we, we understand the assurance of the Holy Spirit. So there are a few of uh, the scriptures that we covered last time. And we spoke briefly about is the Holy Spirit a ghost? And, it, and I really meant for that to be an opportunity to um, expand, you know, our, our definition. Uh, ghost, spirit, we don't want to think of it in the occult, paganistic manner. We want to understand that because God is a spirit, right? Jesus now, the Messiah, is not dwelling with us physically, but he's dwelling with us in the spirit of the Holy Spirit who he promised and sent to us, right? So we want to be thinking of the Holy Spirit and worshiping in spirit. We spoke many to- uh, much about that last time. Um, because again, it's like with like forms, right? As the more, Jesus, Jesus the Messiah said, two very important things, and you probably will recognize this. He said first that he didn't want to lose any that the Father had given him, right? And then he said second, I would that they would be one with us as we are one. Well, you know that it's very difficult to get oil and water, right, to blend. Of course, there's a lot of shaking right involved but it doesn't st- it, it won't stay uh blended for very long because they're two different substances so here we're speaking about being able to blend to work with the holy trinity we have to become more like the holy trinity so that we're walking in lockstep with his word with his precepts with his you know in as much as we humanly can with with his his thinking how does how does he present himself uh, and i say he now i'm speaking about the collective holy trinity uh how 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 do we know his patterns we've talked about the patterns what are his characteristic uh ways of speaking through scripture right and and you don't even have to have uh memorized the bible or any given chapter of the Bible, to over time after you have read the word enough, uh, listened to the word enough, you have a, you have a now a more keen uh, ability to pick out, uh, wait a minute, that doesn't sound quite right. You know, if you hear something, is that what he really said? You know, you have now the ability to do more um, discerning of what are the words and what are the, the precepts that the Holy Spirit, that God, our Father, presents to us so that we're no longer uh, subject to grave deceptions. That is, that is the whole purpose now of this Bible study in these parts. Because I firmly believe that as we get closer and closer to the days of uh, the times of Jacob's trouble and the days of the tribulation, uh, we are, it, it, is, it is imperative that we become more and more and more in sync with, in line with, lockstep with the Holy Trinity, their characteristics, their precepts, their ways of doing things so that we are not deceived. Right. And that's the more time you spend in the presence of the Holy Father, the more you are girding up your loins, right? The you're girding up the loins of your mind and your heart, and even your your constitution is stronger. Because you know that you've you've put in the time, right? And so when that time of of trouble comes, when that uh uh, when that attack comes, when the time of persecution really gets ramped up, you will have so grown 
into the spirit, become one with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that now you have the internal constitution, right, to stand up to the persecution with, right, and in coordination with, as we spoke about uh, three weeks ago, with the Holy Trinity. We're not doing this. We're no longer doing this in our own power, right? We're not trying to um, see it with our natural eyes. We're not trying to hear with our natural ears. We're not trying to react with our uh, baser instinct, right? We're now growing closer and closer, more tightly uh, intertwined with, enmeshed with, the Holy Trinity, and how uh, each of those persons of the Holy Trinity would respond. We may not be in our physical bodies capable of dealing with enormous amounts of pain, but when we work in coordination with the Holy Trinity, we, we won't even feel pain. I mean, think about Daniel in the lion's den. Think about the fiery furnace turned up seven times hotter than normal. And in fact, it even singed and burned the people who were trying to get those, those Daniel and his friends into the, into the furnace. But they were standing in the midst of the fire and didn't even get burnt. Didn't even smell of smoke, the scripture says. That's why it's so important for us to build this relationship because those who dwell right in the secret place of the most high are protected, are protected. This is why the scripture says, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, then says that you're not going to go through the valley. But as you go through that valley, you're untouched. You're unfazed. Now, you know, of course, in our in our humanness, right, we may feel something, but I don't, I personally believe, and I believe that I've experienced it, and I think I've shared it with you, that there are times when I would think that I was physically tired or physically unmotivated to do a particular thing. But once in the presence of the Holy Spirit and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the the tiredness or the weakness goes away. Because you're in that moment empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that is likewise how we as the elect, the chosen of our Father, will make it through these days when the tribulations and the persecutions become very intense. And they, and they will. You can see all throughout society uh, in some very real ways Perhaps you who are listening right now may be in one of those countries or cities, towns where um, where people of God, Christians, are experiencing uh, persecution. And I pray that right now, Holy Father, that you would be with them in their presence and give them the strength of mind and character and physical ability to withstand the attack of the enemy. But we know, we know that we know that we know that God is faithful. The one and only true God is faithful to deliver us through whatever the persecution, the attacks are, right? Also, um, we learned that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And we're sealed with the Holy Spirit in the sense that it's like, um, it is as if the Messiah, our Savior, sent us the Holy Spirit as sort of a down payment, right? Uh, kind of like, um, uh, you know, when you, back in the day when you could put things on layaway, you would go in and you put a, per, a certain percentage of the, the the total of your your purchase on uh, leaving it there as a credit, as a marker, as a down payment, right? As, as a promise, almost like a promissory note 
right? That you would come back, hear me, right? Because the Lord, our Savior, said he would come back, right? So that you would come back and pay for, uh, retrieve the rest of those items that you promised uh, to purchase at some later date. Likewise, again, I'll remind you that our our Messiah said, I would that none would be lost. Right? All that you have given me, I have returned to you. Well, how would he? I mean, he can say that because he has left that down payment with us. He has promised us the presence and the unction of the Holy Spirit it, as a way of uh, giving us the ability to know with a surety with faith that he will come back and retrieve us. I mean, that's the blessed hope that we're all seeking. Amen. Uh, so it's that, it's that down payment of our inheritance. What inheritance? The inheritance of the blessed hope, not just the uh, ability to, to perform under the power of the Holy Spirit, but to receive the love and also impart love to help us in our infirmities, to give us hope, right? To, to teach us to be able to search the deep and mis mysterious topics of the word of God. We learn that in uh, Romans 5, verses 3 through 5, that is where the Holy Spirit particularly helps us in our infirmities and helps us to develop a love for others. Romans 8 and 26, we just mentioned before. Uh, Romans 15 and 13. And I think we already mentioned Galatians 5 and 5 uh, for patience. <laughs> and I repeat that because I'm working on it. Amen. Amen. Uh, for comfort and communication. Acts chapter 9 and verse 31. To reveal future events. Remembering that we read in Amos that uh, God is will do no thing unless he reveals it to his prophets. So where, where do we see all of these things coming together? Well, it comes together as we grow in relationship, as we begin to hear with our spiritual ears, see with our spiritual eyes. You know, you know, you know that this is happening with you when... Now you hear something in the world, um, I don't know, let's say you hear about a multitude of earthquakes happening. You know, in years before, maybe, or even months before, you might have just said, oh, gosh, another earthquake. My goodness, you know, another, another uh, tornado, another, you know, uh, hurricane. But now you think of it as, oh, wait a minute. I've read the word. I know. That as I'm seeing and hearing these things occurring more and more and more with greater intensity, right? Being sped up, sped up, sped up. Things right now in the world are happening so fast. It's, it's just, it's, it's almost, it's almost uh, bewildering, right? Because they're happening so fast. Uh, for example, you know, if you bought a computer, a laptop four years ago, by the time you you know, it was delivered to you, you got it home and you just learned, you know, got really accustomed to it. Well, it's already six months later, it's defunct because it was already six months old when you got it Yeah, in terms of technology and its advancements. So the soon as you get something, you know, the next few months is already obsolete or other types of technologies have already superseded it because things are happening so much faster now than they used to be. But so now when you hear about these things and you see these things, you begin to see it and hear it and experience it with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. So in, I, I believe I said, revealing future events, Acts chapter one, uh, verse 16, Acts chapter 28 and 25, he calls another thing that the Holy Spirit does how do you how do you know or how do you how do you imagine you came to be hearing even these podcasts how do you how did you come to 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 find the church that maybe you attend or the bible study group that you have 
you think that ju it just popped into the air, you know, one day you're walking along and you happen to accidentally fall into this church or this Bible study? No, the Holy Spirit calls us, guides us. Remember, the shepherd is leading and guiding with his ra uh, uh, staff. So he's guiding us into certain missionaries or uh, to become uh, pastors or become evangelists or whatever the gifts are that we uh, also read in Galatians. Acts 20 and 28 speaks to this directly uh, with regards to pastors. Acts 13 and 2 speaks directly regarding the missionaries. And uh, it is important that we get this because in these times, we're not just dealing with, right, the natural realm, right? And I think uh, in earlier Bible studies, we talked about the, the natural, the preternatural, and the supernatural. And the natural being, you know, this physical level of existence that we have here on as our feet touch the terra firma, right? The world uh, be below the heavens, experienced primarily, right, through our five senses, uh, our hearing, our sight, uh, smell, right, taste, uh, those kinds of things. But not, we're not necessarily experiencing this earthly level uh, in, in terms of a spirit being, right? Because we're, we're here, we can feel the cold, we can he feel the heat. <laughs> Have mercy, can we feel the heat here in Florida? Yes, um, we're feeling the heat, amen. Uh, and other parts of the world too, as I've, I've noticed when I look at the weather. But primarily through those senses, through the natural man, not the spirit man, but in the preternatural, that is that level beyond the natural or above, right? Predator, predator from the Latin is beyond. That, that which is suspended between the natural and the supernatural. And for those of you who uh, really like, um, uh, what would it be? The geology or the cosmology, right? We're talking about the stratosphere, <laughs> the, the levels from the stratosphere to the exosphere. So some three, 375 miles to 6,200 miles above earth, right? That existence. <laughs> and and this, the supernatural transcends that, right? Goes beyond that. If we were, if we were putting slices, you know, uh, the natural up to the clouds where, where the where the natural eyes can see, unaided by any uh, you know binoculars, et cetera, et cetera, and then and then beyond that, three hundred seventy five miles beyond that, you know, to sixty two hundred miles is that that you know the stratosphere way up there, right? And then and then the supernatural goes even beyond that, transcends beyond the natural and the preternatural, above and beyond and even outside, right? Because the Lord, our Father, said that the earth is his footstool. I mean, even, you know, if you said that to a kindergartner, they, they would be able to draw the picture very easily for you. They put the earth and they put, you know, the Lord, our God on a, on a, on a chair, and they have his feet resting on the earth. I mean, th that's a very, you know, uh, childlike, very easy concept to sort of gasp, grasp. And then as we, um, you know, as we can see clearly those things that we cannot see with our natural eye, uh, talks about that area that is so far above. Not only we can't, can we not see it with our natural eyes, but we also cannot experience it right? With our hearing, with our taste, with our smell. So these are the preternatural or the supernatural. Now you get to see why. Why is this important for us to focus on developing our spirit man, our spiritual side, so that we are able to perceive and understand 
those entities, spirits, right? Those functionaries that are occurring beyond that which we can see with our natural eye. Right? We we wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? Uh, what is that? If he's, uh, is that Ephesians uh, 6? <clears throat> I believe so. Ephesians 6 and 12. For we wrestle, for we are not, from the Amplified, it says we are not wrestling with, almost as in present tense, right? We are not wrestling with flesh and blood, contending only with physical opponents. You're not only struggling against the rain, the wind, and the sun, right? You're not only struggling against the snow, the, the long work day, the, you know, the night, the daylight, the darkness, the, you know, et cetera, right? You're not only struggling against the wind and the rain, the physical components. You're not only struggling against people and their attitudes here in the natural level, right, other humans, but you're also against the despotisms, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness. Now that's a mouthful, but if you re if you repeat it slowly, and let's do that, in the Amplified, against the powers, against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness against the spirit forces of wickedness in the heavenly supernatural sphere. I That may even be repeating one more time. Against the master spirits who are the world rulers of this present darkness against the forces of wickedness in supernatural spheres in the heavenly. And then in 13, it's like, so because this is where we are, because this is what we are confronting in the now moment, right? Put on the complete armor of God so that you may be able to resist and stand your ground on the evil day of danger. And having done all, done all what? Done all the reading, done all of the resting in faith, done all the waiting for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, done all the fasting and praying, right? Having done all that the crisis demands, Stand firmly in your place. How have you ever thought? What would you do if a, a, a band of folks, you know, two or more, came knocking on your door and demanded that you leave your home right away, or demanded that you turn over your, uh, I don't know, your stock, your stock of uh, food or water? How would you respond in that moment? And and. I pray that no one is going through this immediately in this in this moment. Um, and if you if you have experienced this, then share with us how you how you were able to stand, right? But it's have you ever thought about that? Being in that moment, what have you ever thought about really how you would how you would conduct yourself if someone came and asked you the question? Do you believe in the Most High God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And meanwhile, they're holding, you know, an axe in their hand, ready to to chop your head off or a foot off or an arm off, depending on your answer. Right, much like the the apostles' experience, Stephen, Paul, uh, Peter, they were able to stand in those moments of crisis because they had already girded up their loins, right, with, with truth and with faith and with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. They had already become one with the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son. So they had the, in, the internal 
uh, fortitude, as you can say, right? The, the, the emotional stability within to be sober about the situation. Could you do that? Are you able? Have you considered it? Right? Because we don't want to be, you know, remember Peter, right? He said, oh, no, Lord, I would never, I would never deny you. No, 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 I would never turn away from you, right? And 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 the Messiah called him out. No, no. By the time the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And, you know, we can be like Peter in, in, in moments of relative calm, right? <laughs> in moments of relative peace, uh, where there's no disturbance, when we're not hungry, we're not cold, uh, we're not too hot, we're not, uh, you know, uh, uh, tired from a long walk or a long day of work. We can be, we can have that. But what happens in the moment when there is the testing? When they're, you know, when the, when the, when the uh, rubber hits the road, as they say, we I pray that we all have in that moment the anointing of the Holy Spirit to rest upon us immediately, so that we are given the right response. Remember, He said that I will give you the words. You don't have to practice your words. You don't have to rehearse your, you know, your situation, because as you've been walking with me, as you've been listening to me, I will give you the words that you need in that moment. When you go before the courts, when you go before the judge, when you go before, you know, when you were standing before your enemy. In that moment, we talked about last time, you know, how we've read about, uh, you know, a, a frail, a uh, hundred pound uh, person being able to lift up a 2000 pound vehicle, you know, because in that moment, right then and there, the anointing of the Holy Spirit allowed the person to have the strength, the strength, right, beyond the natural. To pick up that vehicle. So we want to we want to be ready to receive that. We want to be opened to that Holy Spirit. And push as we as we resist the devil, right? Because the scripture says, if you resist the devil, he will flee. Well, you've got to you've got to build yourself up with the ability to resist the devil. Right. And then as as you are resisting him, right, the father says, I will always give you a way out. So as you're resisting, as you're standing firm, as we just read, then the anointing of the Holy Spirit has the power to work with you because you have already been working with him. And them, right, <laughs> the three the three parts of the of the Holy Trinity. Uh, if you read further um, in your spare time, uh, the Book of Enoch, um, and I'm talking specifically about the Book of Enoch, uh, chapters 39 through 67, and also Second Enoch and Three Enoch, you will find the descriptions of the heavens. Now, in your, um, if you are further interested in that, you can, you know, Google it or whatever. But the Bible speaks clearly about three levels of heaven you'll find uh, uh genesis 28 and 12 deuteronomy 10 and 14 first kings 8 and 27 talks about this spiritual realm uh containing uh those um entities of spirits the angels the most high uh the the, the spiritual realm where they travel where they exist right again it's beyond what we can see with our natural eyes. Uh, Paul, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, I think somewhere around verse 2, and also 2 Corinthians, if you read all of chapter 12 and all of chapter 13, uh, Paul discuss uh, the third heaven as being a paradise. And he also further states that this is where no mortal, right, no natural man, person uh, is permitted but in this third heaven this is where uh, you experience or can see things that are not able to be spoken of i mean think about it they're so are some right they invoke such uh, uh, enormity such an impact 
that you have no words, right, to, to fully express it. I find this uh, when you're re reading the book of Revelation. You know, John often says these are things that, you know, the multitude that he could not number and the sights that it were just too, in, you know, too impactful for him to, to, to absorb almost, right? Uh, because this, this, is not, this is not our normal, right? This is not our natural way of experiencing things. Imagine being in, in the spirit, right? And, and now having spiritual eyes that are, uh, that are cleared of their, of their cataracts. You know, you don't have the, 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 the atmosphere getting in the way, you know, like when you look through, um, when you look through a camera lens, right? And you're taking a picture, uh, you have all of that stuff, the lens, the atmosphere, the dust in the air, the light in the air, you know, all of that stuff in between your vision and the object to which you're focusing on. Imagine not having those constraints, not having the constraints of being held down to a physical place on this planet, but to be arising above and being able to see beyond. It's amazing when you read uh, the book of Enoch, his perspective of in the heavens. And then even when he came back as sort of an angelic feature uh, to, his, to his family. Imagine if you can possibly just, you know, that is why, I mean, it, it, it makes perfect sense, right? That we have to have a glorified body, a spirit body, a glorified body that is able to exist in this realm beyond, right, the natural. I mean, you, you know, you've heard of things like when you go uh, so many feet down into the ocean, there's pressure, right? So you have to have a special suit on, right? And when you go down to do scuba diving, you have to bring some air with you because in that environment, there is no oxygen by which your current body is able to breathe. Right? So now you have, you, you're, we are being transformed into our new man, our new way of thinking, our new way of perceiving. Now, and, and, what the, and all that that entails, right? So now we're ready, we're be, being made ready, amen, um, to experience that environment without the aid of, let's say, oxygen, for example, right? Or without the aid of uh, a scuba gear. Uh, without the aid of the the uh, the, the uh, 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 what is it gravity, we're able to we're able to look and experience um, those surroundings in the condition in the form that's necessary that spiritual man that spiritual form uh, that we can. You know, imagining wanting to experience um, swimming or diving, you know, so many feet below the surface without the encumbrance of scuba gear, right? Imagine being able to fly through the air without the aid of some jetpack or an airplane or a kite, right? We're talking about a, a transformation here that that supersedes, right? Transcends, goes above and beyond what we're currently able to do. So we naturally, so naturally, uh, so obviously we would have to be equipped, right? Uh, to be able to handle those different types of atmosphere and uh, and that's just putting it in a, in a very simplistic form, right? In a, in a very um, sort of more physical form. But when you're thinking about it in the spiritual form, you remember when the Israelites were, or the Hebrews, I should say, were in the wilderness and Moses was going up to the mountain to speak with the Lord. And a couple of instances there, they specifically say, 
uh, you know, listen, tell, <laughs> and I'm putting it in, you know, colloquial terms, tell, tell the most high, we just can't tolerate his voice, right? You know, let him speak to you and then you tell us what he said because his voice was thundering and you hear about the seven thunders in, uh, I believe it's in Revelation and in Isaiah. You hear about the seven spirits. You hear about the, you know, Moses being in the light of the, of the most high so much that his face then was shining, right? So, so imagining, and remember in that same instance, he had to cover his face because his face shone so brightly that they that their natural eyes right couldn't handle it just as us just as if we look at the sun we're always warned don't look directly at the sun with your natural eyes right because your natural eyes are are incapable of dealing with that intense light well they were hearing the lord directly the thunderings from the mountain and they were like look no Tell them to be quiet, right? Because it was too it was too much for their natural ears. But when you read in Revelation that all the, the choirs of heaven, the heavenly hosts are singing and glorifying the Lord, your your ears will now be will now be equipped with spiritual transformation so that you can withstand the trumpets blowing and the great choruses singing loud, hailing the Lord. And you will be involved in that. Remember, it, you won't be like, uh, you know, in church now, uh, if you go to church, if you're in a church and, you know, 30 minutes has gone by and you're tired, right? Because you won't be, at, you won't be functioning in your, in your physical earthly traction, you know, this contraption that we're in, these bounds, these con, uh, constraints that we have. You'll be functioning on a whole new level time won't even be of essence right remember he says in uh, in revelation that he will be providing the light there will be no more darkness when he comes in when he's when we are in his presence we're in the light no more darkness no more day no more night no need of the sun or the moon the scripture says so if there's no need of the sun or the moon we won't really even have a concept i'm imagining of time passing as we did here in the natural realm, the earthly realm. <laughs> this is just, I get real excited about this because I mean, it's just, if you, if you know, if you have an imagination um, at all, and I, and I'm sure many of you do, it's just mind blowing, right? It's gobsmacking as they say, it's all you, you, I believe that we will be awestruck. I believe that in those 30 minutes of silence, <laughs> that it speaks about in Revelations, that's when we are so dumbfounded that we literally can't speak, <laughs> right? And that, and that the, the, the earth falls silence in the presence of a holy God, in, in, the, in the enormity of his Holy Spirit being blanketed. When the, when the heavens crack open and the skies crack open and all will see the glory of the Lord, we, you will have to be quiet in the presence. What can you possibly say? And maybe that's a, you know, maybe there's more to that, that transition. And we've talked about that before, but I just can't, I, it's, it's almost, it's, it's stronger than an intermission, right? It's stronger than halftime. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, the stop time with regards to music. You know, you have the call and response and then you have a stop time where all the music, all the activity stops. And it's so poignant, it's so significant, that quiet, that stopping, that it causes awe, right? It causes you to be amazed. I can't think of any other, <laughs> I, can't, I can't think of, a, of an earthly example. Uh, that 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 would cause such a uh, such fear and awe and 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 worship in that moment. Then at that moment in time, when we see the glory of the Lord descending, Amen. Wow, I, I'm telling you, I get excited about it. So the supernatural again uh, is focused on an acts. 
I think I mentioned it before, but Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, verse 8 and 41. So let's go there. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, there were all assembled together in one place, when suddenly there came a sound from heaven, like the rushing of a violent tempest blast, and it filled the whole house in which they were sitting. Here's that sound. You know, if you've lived in uh, any place with a with an L, with a with a subway, or uh, you've been in the subway waiting for a train to come, there's a there's a feeling that as the the vacuum and the pressure, you know, of, of the force of that train coming down the tunnel pushing the air and the force of the air going by and the 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 temperature that comes along with it and the roar of the tracks and the metal going against each other it just sounds like uh, an enormous uh, uh, tornado or hurricane a rush of wind coming through or if you've lived uh you know Chicago or uh, New York where they have the L and your your homes are right next to it you can feel the the thunder the the reverberation, the vibration of the train coming down the track, not only hear it, but in some senses you can smell and you can, you know, just feel the the shaking, right? I have a train track um, roughly, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a mile or less away from me. And and, uh, there are times when I can really feel that vibration, even being that far away. Well, you can imagine Imagine here, suddenly came a sound from heaven, like the rushing of a violent tempest blast, and it fills the whole house. You know, in in Florida, uh, and in many other places, I'm sure, where it's very hot, you can, if you go outside of your door, when it's very hot, and when the humidity is high, uh, you go outside of your door, and you get that blast of heat coming in your face, you know, or when you've baked a cake or something in your oven, you open up that oven and that blast of it. It's almost, you know, this overwhelming, all-encompassing reverberation, right? And it filled their whole house, the scripture says. And there appeared them tongues resembling fire, which were separated and distributed and which settled on each one of them. Now, you have to know that this was a supernatural experience right this was not right this is not your everyday uh uh go to meeting uh bible study uh, carrying your 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 bottle of water and your bible and you got your pen and your markers you know and you're sitting down you know having a bible study no this is not your everyday event number one and it is not a natural event right because i can tell you right now we don't see in the natural, any flames of fire coming and resting on us when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Unless you're experiencing it in the spirit, the spirit which is beyond the natural, right? So it's supernatural. And I know, the, you know, the world likes to make these things uh, uh, lean more to the occult. But God is supernatural. Right, the whole the holy creator of the universe is a spirit. By virtue of him being a spirit, he is supernatural. He is above and beyond, right, and outside of nature. So clearly, you know, if you're sitting somewhere and you see tongues of fires, or you know, a lapping. Of fire, I don't imagine they were tongues like in our physical tongue that's in our mouth, but rather, you know, this this lapping lash, if you can imagine, you know, fire flickering, right, coming through, resembling fire, right? It said resembling fire, which were separated, so that you know each one receive receiving them. I think there was 120, right, uh, people. And distributed and separated amongst them, settling on each one. And and here is where we we need to just think beyond the words in a sense. Remembering that God the Father is operating in wisdom. 
So we talked about this before with regards to the Mercedes and the 13 year old, right? Uh, he's giving you the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that which you can stand, that which you can partake in that moment, or that which you need in that moment. Right? Because he's never giving us more than we can handle. Right? So he knows precisely the dosage, right? <laughs> the dosage that we need of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's a beautiful thing to, to, to realize. And they were all filled, diffused throughout their soul, the Amplified says, with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other different foreign languages as the spirit kept giving them clear and loud expression notice that and sometimes we read you know sometimes too quickly to appreciate what it's really saying but notice it says as the spirit kept giving them clear and loud expression there again is that wisdom uh not giving us too much you know more than we can handle giving us what we need as, right? Kept giving them as clear and loud expression. So keep giving. So the Holy Spirit is going to keep giving you. It, yes, you may feel it in that moment as on Pentecost. And some say that, you know, the true Pentecost, I think I mentioned this before, is um, occurs between July 23rd through the 27th. Uh, depending again, you know, on those calendars and and and, and all of that, we've we've talked about briefly. But um, if that in fact comes, and if you're waiting until that moment, Amen. I I I, I <laughs> you know I I struggle to want to wait, but we need to learn to wait. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. But um, my goodness, you know, imagine you know on the 23rd of July, right? Boom! This lashing of the Holy Spirit comes blowing through your house and, you know, bowling you over with, with, with the spirit and the power of the Holy Ghost, right? But yet, not more than you can handle. That's a, that's a wise God. That is a true leader, right? Knowing how much to give you in that moment and then to keep giving you. Right? You may feel it, you, you may have that moment Right. But then the Holy Spirit will keep giving. I, I, I just. Oh, hallelujah. That he keeps giving us what we need. Amen. Verse eight. Uh, yes. Verse eight. Then how is it that we hear? And this is what they were saying with regards to the people uh, who were criticizing. Then how is it that we hear each of us in our own particular dialect to which we were born because remember there were galatians parthians medes elamites mesopotamia judah cappadocia pontus of asia and phrygia and pamphylia and egypt and libya and, Cy and cyrene you know how was it that they were able to understand those languages each of each separate to themselves and others other languages than they had previously known Right? This is the impact of the Holy Spirit. This is that supernatural ability. You know, we, we sometimes give a lot of, um, or how should I say, maybe don't give as much uh, credence to, um, let's say, the person that has the ability to uh, multiply several numbers in a row, or add several numbers in a row, or recite uh, extremely long. Um, uh, poems or uh, even chapters of the Bible, right? We 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 kind of are in awe by it, maybe a little bit amazed by it, you know, and it, oh wow, you know. But really thinking about all that it goes into and that is required, you know, and and these people that we may be observing makes it look easy, right? But it took it takes the anointing. Right of the Holy Spirit to hear with a spiritual ear and see with spiritual eyes what the Holy Father is trying to convey to us without right the trappings of our carnal nature right without those trappings 
and they were, you know, explaining to these folks who who claimed that they were perhaps uh, drunk or, drunk or something uh, on 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 wine. And, and this this goes again to this idea that um, the true Pentecost occurs at the time of the new wine, uh, which uh, again goes back to sort of the calendar readings and knowing that there's a new wine and then there's a latter wine, the first new grapes, right? And this was this is believed to be that time, the time of the new wine. So if they had been uh, accused of drinking the new wine, right? Uh, but they had to make sure that they made it clear, no, we haven't been drinking of this new wine and giving them explanation. And you can, you can imagine that that could be a perception, right? Uh, other people observing uh, you in the unction of the Holy Spirit, like for instance, lifting up the car, right? I mean, if you were in that moment and you ran over and lifted up a car and held it up long enough to, to, for a person to be pulled out, well, other people around would be amazed and in awe. Oh my goodness! You know how strong you are. How in that moment, how you know, and just all in, encompassing in that moment, may and might even say some things that we could hear today, where somebody might say, "Oh well, you know, if they were a naysayer, right? Oh, they were probably taking some drugs, and that's how come they were able to do that." Or, uh, no, they were taking, you know, those stimulants and that's, they had too much coffee that day and they could lift up that car or, you know, they, they might be attributing it to those kinds of experiences rather than seeing it through the spiritual eyes, right? Through experiencing it through the spirit senses, that this is the power of the holy, our holy God coming and anointing us in that moment with the, with the strength needed. To, to lift up that car. You see, that's why it's so important. And I think in that, in that um, description, in that example, you can see why it's so important to put aside the worldly interpretation, right? And as I said before about giving credit to the world and to, you know, drugs and science and vitamin. Well, you know, he takes vitamins, you know, you know, or, well, he is constantly lifting weights. Well, yeah, you could put it up, you could, you could say all those things, or you could just as easily and under the unction of the Holy Spirit acknowledge that it's only through a holy God empowering you in the precise moment with the precise ability to do that which you're called upon doing. Called upon by the Holy Spirit, right? Because you can imagine, you know, in, in a setting similar, you might have two or three other people standing around. And then there's that one person in the crowd that goes in to, you know, to do the CPR. Or that one person in the crowd that says, you know, oh, well, I'm going to jump in that water and try to save that child or person. And there may be 10 or 20 people standing around. But only you or they, that person under the unction of the Holy Spirit, you know, strikes them in their heart in their spirit, go in, jump in. How does a, how do, you know, some people are trained to do it. Firemen, EMS, perhaps military folks, but the ordinary common, you know, individual walking around is not necessarily uh, gonna just rush right into a fire, right? Into a back draft and try to pull someone out. Only under the training as in a fireman, but the ordinary average person, no, they have to be empowered by something well beyond, or right, well beyond our understanding. And that is supernatural. So supernatural is not a negative. Supernatural should not only be thought of as in the occult, right? Because all of these creations God created first, and he said it was all perfect, and it was all good. So when he originally gave the ability, amen, to hear his voice, when he originally gave the ability to walk with Adam in the garden, his Holy Spirit dwelling and hovering in the garden, when he initially gave the ability to interpret a dream and experience a vision given by the Holy Spirit, 
it was pure and it was holy and it was good. Only now and after the influence of a perverted evil in the hands of a lawless entity does it become occult and sinful. You would dare say that Daniel was being a seer and uh, you know, interpreting dreams was occult. Well, what was Daniel doing? He was under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Right? You would dare say that that when uh, Moses was speaking <laughs> with the Lord, oh, well, he was under the influence of a demonic spirit. No. Those were in the hand, those tools were in the hand of God first. He created them perfect in their form for his use to bring about his perfect plan. Only when Satan perverts our thoughts, again, that carnal nature, that carnal definition, because, you know, you can sometimes say to somebody something, you know, something about the human body. Oh, you know, boy, look at that shapely person. Well, you can take it as a wholesome good compliment in the creator developing this human form or you could take it in the profane right direction so we have a choice again goes back to a, another conversation we had many many weeks ago right we have that choice so you today have a choice do you want to walk in concert with in coordination with the holy trinity and experiencing that indwelling that we've been talking about, uh, the ability to have patience and assurance and overcoming the flesh, you have a choice. Do you want to be one with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Or do you want to walk opposite, in an opposite direction, to Yahuwah and His Spirit? So, this is kind of uh, an extenuation of what we were talking about in the first part. And then, and now we're talking about more clarity, more precision about the when, where, how, and wow, uh, why, excuse me, of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And is it necessary to have the Holy Spirit? I think we've covered it here that it is clearly necessary because as we discovered in Ephesians 6 and 12, we can't operate, we cannot deal with the uh, supernatural beings on a natural level. Amen? That is why we need to pray. That is why we may need to fast. That is why we need to be walking in concert with the Holy Spirit. Because it, we need those, we need that tool guiding us. We need that uh, perspective in order to properly see and comprehend those beings, those people in people in high places, those uh, despotisms, we need to be able to see clearly through the eyes of our Father, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, so that we can uh, ascertain, so we can definitively understand what we're dealing with. Right, you would not go into a uh, hospital operating room with, uh, you know, with your knitting needles and your and your yarn. Right, you you don't go as as the as folks say today. You wouldn't go to a um, a knife fight, a gunfight with a knife. Right. Well, you certainly same premise. You don't want to go dealing with uh, these supernatural beings in the constraint of your natural man, natural person. You want to be going under the unction So, as I was saying, we want to be operating um, with, with, you know, in conjunction with the Holy Spirit, in conjunction with the supernatural power matching our spirit to 
his spirit. Making sure that we are hearing from the Lord, hearing the Holy Spirit, allowing him to work in us and through us so that then we can challenge and match the powers with, of course, with the Holy Spirit um, to those principalities and those spirits in high places that are causing us persecution, attacking, etc. We want to also remember that we need to be more in the spirit so that we are uh, creating a temple, right, where the Holy Spirit can dwell. I think I've asked the question before. Can the Holy Spirit dwell in you? Are you a vessel by which the Holy Spirit would find a home in? You know, can you can he be at home in you? Right? Probably is more the pertinent question than than whether we can um well uh, I don't know, probably is both ways, whether we can be at home in him and whether he can be at home in us probably, you know, works simultaneously, right? In order for it really to work well. Uh, and that is where the idea of um, how can the spirit work with us if we're not obedient to the spirit's promptings, if we're not giving ourselves over fully to the Holy Spirit, then he and the Holy Trinity is not allowed to work within us. That is why it was so important to ask the question uh, about ourselves. Are we operating in the flesh in a carnal way or are we operating in a more spiritual way? Are we walking with the spirit, you know, one-on-one -on -one lockstep or are we simply, you know, going on our own direction? And so for us to continue to explore that, uh, let me give you some additional uh, scriptures. I would probably have mentioned before John 16, verses 7 through 9, and also 14. John 6 and 63, and also verse 68. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 through 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6, 10. 21 and 22. And then again, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, 6, 7, and 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, 10 through 12, and also 15. So let us see if we can determine by all that we have already talked about, is it still something that we can, uh, something we desire, right, in our lives, something that is necessary to our lives. Uh, is the Holy Spirit necessary? Well, we've talked about it to one extent, that in order for us to challenge those persecutors, our enemy, we really need to be in lockstep, right? But let's talk, let's look at some other ways that we can explore whether it truly really is necessary. I mean, after all, we all have different gifts and talents, right? Maybe it's not your gift, you might be thinking to yourself. Or maybe you might be saying, well, gee, that's just something I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can do. Well, this is the time now, right, while we're in a relative peace and safety to explore whether this is an area for us. We don't want to get, you don't want to get into the middle of the battle, right, and then find out, oh my goodness. I'm not there yet, <laughs> right? That would be the that'd be the worst thing to do. So let's uh, go ahead and look at John chapter sixteen, starting with verse seven, and reading seven through nine, uh, reading from the Amplified text. However, I am telling you nothing but the truth when I say it is profitable, good expedient and advantageous for you that I go away because if I do not go away the comforter the counselor the helper the advocate the intercessor the strengthener 
the standby will not come to you into close fellowship with you. See, the Lord, our Messiah, is making it clear that he, it is needful for him to go away in order that the Holy Spirit can have a close fellowship with you. But if I, but if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. Remember, his desire is that we be one with the Father and one with him. And of course, we know there's only one way to the Father, right? Is that through the Messiah. And when he comes, he will convict you. When he comes, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will convict and convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin and about righteousness. So you see, one of the ways that we can be effective in our witness, more effective in our witness, is clearly if we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, he would empower us to even be able to witness. You know, you may not say, you may not be able to say, well, in my, you know, in my natural human state, my ordinary state, I don't know if I can witness to other people about the power of the Lord. I don't know if I can, if I can really share my story. Um, and so many people tend to, um, tend to be a little, you know, nervous about it or uh, skittish about whether they can share their stories. But when you're empowered with the Holy Spirit, he, as the scripture said, is the strengthener. He is the intercessor. So I said before that the Lord promised that he would give you the words that you need. You don't need to practice. You don't need to, you know, write out a script. You don't need, and, and, I'm, and I can, I'm here to tell you, I have written out scripts before, and the Holy Spirit leads me in a totally different direction. So uh, it may not even be uh, appropriate, you know, to write out a script because you really don't know who you're going to meet, where you're going to meet them, what their situations are. So you really can't have, uh, you know, a, a, a script per se because every situation would be different. And you don't know how much time you have. You could be on a bus, in a cab, on the airplane. You know, it depends. So many things would uh, determine how long you have to share your story. And only as you adapt to the person that you're speaking with, right? So, again, it would be kind of, um, you know, kind of silly to try to have a script prepared prior to. So all the more reason to allow the Holy Spirit to be the intercessor within you and also the intercessor between you and the other person that you're communicating with. Amen. So that's one reason why it would be necessary. John, oh, I'm sorry, did we read nine? And uh, verse nine is, I will bring, he says in verse eight, let's go back. When he comes, he will convict and convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin and about righteousness, uprightness of heart and right standing with God and about judgment and about sin because they do not believe in me, trust in, rely on, and adhere to me. Adding to the point that it is necessary for the Holy Spirit to be empowering us precisely because a person may be in disbelief, precisely because they have doubts, precisely because they have seen and heard, you know, all that the world has to say about Christians and how they behave and churchgoers and, you know, all those kinds of things, all the things, the baggage that they might have experienced uh, in the past regarding, uh, you know, quote unquote, churchgoers, right? We, so we don't want to, we want to make sure that we're operating, working with the Holy Spirit so that he intervenes to give us the, the correct words, the correct attitude to bring to that situation. Because the Holy Spirit, of course, would have brought that person into your, into your space or brought you into their space. So he would already have knowledge 
of what that person needs to hear. Another reason not to have, you know, some formulaic uh, approach, some formula, step-by-step -step approach to sharing your witness with someone else. Um, because the Holy Spirit knows exactly what that person may need. Amen. So let, then let's go on to John chapter 6. And verse 63. And again, from the Amplified, it is the spirit who gives life. He is the life giver. The flesh conveys no benefit, whatever. There is no profit in it. The words, truths that I have been speaking to you are spirit and life. And verse 68. Or let's go ahead and read the uh, 60. Let's go ahead and read the whole part, 63 through 68, but, 64, but still some of you fail to believe and trust and have faith, for Jesus knew from the first who did not believe and who had no faith and who would betray him and be false. There it is. Remember, we always want to find scripture to, to support um, what we're conveying. And that verse 64 says it right there. The Holy Spirit never, first of all, the Holy Spirit always comes speaking of the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit never uh, is boasting and, and doing his own thing, right? He's working in coordination with the Holy Trinity. So since he is working in coordination with the Holy Trinity, then we see here in verse 64, Jesus, right, the Son and the Father, already knows. So many people also question, you know, how, how do I know that I'm chosen? Well, the Father already knew. He chose you while you were still being formed in your, in your mother's womb. And it clearly states it right here. He already knew who would accept and who would deny. But the Lord says he would not want that anyone would be lost. So it's not for us to determine who we would uh, share a message to, but allow the Holy Spirit to direct us and vice versa, direct the person to us, right? Because it may be their opportunity that may be there. You may you might be their only opportunity. You might be their last opportunity, right? Because you don't know the exact day or the exact time, the exact hour. And verse 65, and he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him, unless he is enabled to do so by the Father. You see there again, our Messiah is making it clear. All of all, the Holy Trinity works in unison, right? What the Father says, the Son says, and then the Holy Spirit acts in relationship to them. And if the Father didn't choose you or choose that person that you're going to witness to, and it wasn't the right time, and it wasn't the right place, and all those things didn't come together, then it wouldn't have been, it would have been done. So you don't, you know, many times we probably get into a situation of, of witnessing or wanting to share and we're, and we sit there and we, you know, kind of mull over, gosh, should I do this? Is it the right time? Is it the right place? Well, as you uh, continue to walk with the Lord and hear his voice and hear the response, the, the, the prompting, right? In your, in your inner person, in your spirit uh, to speak, you will, you will begin to say to yourself, this must be the time, right? Because the, if, if it were not the time, then all the things wouldn't be falling in place, in other words. So if it were not the time to witness to your neighbor, the neighbor wouldn't have come over and asked for a cup of sugar. 
right? Uh, if it were not the time to witness to someone uh, while you're riding on the bus, then it's very likely that no one would have ever come to sit by you. You understand? So we should never take for granted our interactions. I think I've said that many times before. All of our interactions, uh, if we are walking with the Holy Spirit, right, we say that our steps are ordered by the Lord. So therefore, all of our interactions are on purpose. There's no, you know, fluke, right? There's no fluke except on our own behalf, right? Because we, we in our humanness, don't know perhaps the, the preordained moment, right? But if we're walking in lockstep with the Holy Spirit, being prompted and led by him, then we can't say that any interaction is by accident. It's on purpose, either on purpose for you and your growth or on purpose for the person to whom you are speaking. Amen. Amen. And amen. And verse 66. After this, many of his disciples drew back, returned to their old associations, and no longer accompanied him. And there is a very good point. Remember that he, the Messiah here, is making it known to all of those that are following him. Right, he's trying to make it clear to them. Uh, first of all, if you're here, you were probably chosen to be here. You were chosen to be here in this moment, right? Because I don't do anything without the Father, and the Holy Spirit doesn't do anything without all of us working together. Then he said, then he drives the message home. But still, some of you may fail to believe. That's in verse sixty-four. And fail to have trust and fail to have faith. But the Messiah, from the beginning, knew who did not believe and had no faith. But you see, he still shared the message. He still shared the message. And yet, there were those who, in that moment, still turned away. That's what's happening in verse 66. And they no longer followed him. And 67, then the Messiah, Yahushua, said to the 12, will you also go away? And do you too desire to leave me? And Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words and the message of eternal life. The Father with the Son and the Holy Spirit operating will prompt the other person, maybe to seek you out. Maybe they've heard of your messages before. Maybe they've heard of your reputation, right? And, and there's something in their spirit is causing them something. The Holy Spirit is pushing them toward you to inquire of you and ask questions. And when they come to you, uh, that is why it is important for us to have the faith that, number one, they wouldn't be coming unless it was a foreordained time, right, moment. And it may be that at that, that particular time, they're now ready to receive what you're going to say. But again, the important part of that is since we don't know, right, since we don't know, because the Father and the Son knows, the Holy Spirit knows, since we don't know, it is important for us to do what we are instructed to do, which again is to share our witness, to spread the word, to teach, to preach, to heal, right, to cast out demons just as our uh, Messiah does. He said we would do these things and more. And, of course, we will know through the prompting of the Holy Spirit what is appropriate and what uh, and when it's appropriate. Amen. But we can't, uh, again, we can't go on our own humanness and our own carnal, you know, thoughts. Because it could be that, let's say you had a neighbor, right, that you, you, didn't, you didn't like. You know, you got a neighbor you don't like, you got a co-worker you don't like, 
um, and and just in your you know your humanness and your flesh, you don't like them when they come around you. You just can't you know you don't like them. They just they have, for whatever reason you may have had a, a confrontation with them before. But if the Holy Spirit is leading them to come to you, and we're being taught day by day, faith by faith, moment by moment, to be graceful, then we are then we need to receive that person, right? And to do what the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, is uh, prompting us to do. And you know, I I'm, I'm the first to say that that could be a very difficult thing, you know, particularly when you don't when you quote unquote don't like someone, and you and you and you have to ask yourself what's the most important thing, to do what the Father has asked, or to allow flesh, your flesh to keep you from being obedient, right? Because you have nothing to fear from any human being. We just talked about that before in Ephesians 6. Uh, it is not the human being, it is not flesh and blood that we need to worry about. And I think the Messiah also says uh, at another point, um, do not be afraid of those that can hurt the body, right? But be afraid of the one who can hurt, hurt or harm the body and the spirit. Speaking, of course, of himself, he only he alone has the power to do that, and he alone gives others the power to do it, as we saw with the Israelites or the Hebrews uh, throughout their uh, journeys. Next point, First Corinthians, chapter two. starting with verse 4, 4 through 15. And my language and my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, and plausible words of wisdom, but they were in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power, a proof by the Spirit and the power of God operating on me and stirring in the minds of my hearers of those who are listening right the whole the most holy emotions thus persuading them here is that key point again that i you know keep making it probably sounds repetitive uh, by this point but we if we're not if we operate under the promptings of the holy spirit we don't have to then establish some preset message, right? He says here, not my language and my message were not set forth in persuasive, enticing, or plausible words of wisdom. So he didn't, he didn't set aside, a, a, you know, a speech that he was going to give, right? He didn't uh, practice, memorize something persuasive and full of, you know, uh, enticing language, uh, tickling the ears, right? Because he's, he is relying on the Holy Spirit, as he says in the next clause, but they were in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power, a proof by the Spirit and the power of God. That is where we submit ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit coming from Messiah and with the Father to bring to us the words and the attitude and the tone, right? Um, the the proper uh, sentence structure. I mean, you know, sometimes you're with some people and you may need to, you know how they say, meet them where they are, right? So you do, so you wouldn't, um, let's say, for example, go to some teenagers and use language that would be more uh, fitting of uh, some presidents and and uh, business owners, right? You would want to use language that was geared to that person. 
But here, since you're relying on the Holy Spirit, and it is a testament to the Holy Spirit that those words come to you, the words come to you because he's going to give them to you, right? The, the proper way to, to structure the sentence, maybe even sp- picking up uh, some youthful kind of language that would be appropriate for that teenager, or perhaps it's an older person, or perhaps it's a person, you know, very new to Christianity. So you wouldn't want to be speaking in, you know, some highfalutin, you know, million dollar words, right? Multi-syllable words. Perhaps it needs to be geared to that person. But again, because you're relying on the Holy Spirit, and you're working by the prompting of the Holy Spirit, those words and your approach, your emotions will be in line with what is needed for that individual. As he continues to say, right? It was the whole, by proof of, by the Spirit and power of God operating on me and stirring, right? Prompting in the mind of the Holy emotions and thus persuading them in the minds of the people who are listening the hearers the most holy emotions and thus persuading them so it's not it's not even your words right these are the lord's words these are the words of the holy spirit who's matching the needs of that person or those people that you're speaking with So you don't need to be afraid. You don't need to be worried and then walk away. And and there was a time very early in my ministry when I would be concerned, oh my gosh, did I say the right thing? Did I use the right words? Did I understand? And I now have become comfortable standing in the faith that whatever the words are, whenever they're used, they're the appropriate words. And I can trust that, right? Even if I... Uh, like, for example, if I mispronounce a word, right, as we're all prone to do, we might mispronounce a word, especially reading some of the scriptures. But do you know that the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, is powerful enough to make sure that that listener hears the precise word that they want him to hear, that, that listener to hear. I may say uh, potato, and they need to hear potato. And even as it comes out of my mouth as potato, when it reaches their ears, they hear potato. You understand? We can have that much faith, that much trust in the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us as we give ourselves over to his influence. Amen. And and I think it uh, just adds to it when you read verse 5. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men and human philosophy, but in the power of God. I mean, that just sums it up. Amen. Going on, verse 6. Yet when we are among the full-grown, spiritually mature Christians who are Right in understanding, we do impart a higher wisdom, the knowledge of the divine plan previously hidden. But it is indeed not the wisdom of this present age or of this world, nor of the leaders and rulers of this age who are being brought to nothing and who are doomed to pass away, but rather. What we are setting forth is a wisdom of the Most High, once hidden from the human understanding, and now revealed to us by the Most High, that wisdom which Elohim devised and decreed before the ages for our glorification to lift us into the glory of his presence. You see, everything is in his timing, it's foreordained, it's by his will, and therefore the word of God 
the word of the Most High will never return void. Even if you misspeak, even if you mispronounce, even if, you know, what, sometimes we don't even hear ourselves. You know, have you ever listened to yourself um, after you've done a recording or, uh, you know, if you had the opportunity to, to, to watch yourself in a video, perhaps? Uh, it's amazing that you don't even, you, you're not recognizing sometimes your own voice because it sounds different in your ears, right, than, than when, while you're speaking. You understand? Because it's not focused to, to, toward you. There's so much, there's so much um, uh, technical stuff going on in there, but you're not always hearing uh, exactly how you sound. So that when you hear yourself, unless you're accustomed to hearing, right, yourself, um, you may not even recognize it. But just imagine the power of that then. That um, you may be saying something again. Perhaps you're, you know, you're still in the worrying stage. Did I say it correctly? Did I pronounce it correctly? Did I sound, did I sound stupid? Did I sound silly? Right. Well, it may have been that way to you, but if the Holy Spirit is working within you, and He's matching your message, matching your emotions to the to the person that's listening, and precisely giving them what they need, not basing it on your own wisdom or the wisdom of the world, as he just said in verse 7. None of the rulers of this age or world perceived and recognized and understood this, for if they had, they would have never have crucified the Lord, right? Because he's basically saying, you know, if they if they really knew, if if Satan really knew what the agenda was, they would have never went through with the whole charade of the trial, the mock trial, the fake trial, and then you know, and then his crucifixion coming about. But he got tricked, he got fooled because the Lord, what does he say? He takes the the foolish things, amen, <laughs> to confound the wise. So you may think you sound foolish, right, to yourself, but you may be exactly uh, in fact, I would I would believe that you are exactly doing what the Lord has allowed you to do because you couldn't do it if He didn't allow it, right? He's not going to allow you to go out and represent Him in a fashion uh, that would not meet with His word. You know, you may even set out to do something, and if it's not the right timing, you might get delayed. If it's not the right timing. You might uh, forget, you know, some notes that you had. It's not the right timing. You know, you, no one would ever walk in. So we have to begin to just really rely on the Father. Have that faith that when that moment comes, it is the moment for you to be obedient. Amen. But on the contrary, as the scripture says, this is verse 9, what eye has not seen or ear has not heard, and has not entered into the heart of man all that God has prepared. There it is. We don't know all that God has prepared, either for us or for the other person, right? That God has made and keeps ready, keeps it ready for those who love him. Because remember, he already knew, right? He already knew who was going to accept. He already knew who was going to deny. For those who love him, who hold him in affectionate reverence, promptly obeying him, promptly obeying him, and gratefully recognizing the benefits that he has bestowed. Yet to us, God has unveiled and un, excuse me, unveiled and revealed them by and through his spirit. For the Holy Spirit searches diligently exploring and examining everything, even sounding the profound and bottomless things of God, the divine counsels and the hidden and be and that and those things hidden and beyond man's scrutiny. Very important here. And this, you know, just adds to the 
the, the impact and the, the, the importance, the necessity of having the Holy Spirit working in and through us. Because we may not, again, we may not know the exact word that that, that, that hearer, that, that listener needs to hear. We may not know, in, especially in our, you know, in our humanness, we may not know those words. But the Most High God does know. You may bring up a topic while you're speaking with someone uh, that touches their personal life without your ever knowing, right? You could be, you start up a conversation with someone and you're, you know, just being, following the prompting of the Holy Spirit and you're talking about, you know, one day how the Lord has blessed you, uh, filling up your gas tank, you know, and you don't even, you may not even know that that person has an empty gas tank, right? Because how could you know if you just met them on the bus or in a waiting room? You wouldn't know. But the most high God knows. And also, he knows the right words to put into your mouth so that they can hear the, the deeper, the hidden message that perhaps they were not clear about. It. But again, if you just met this person, you would have no idea, you would have no way of knowing. But we can trust and have faith and believe that the Holy Spirit is going to guide our talk, our speech, guide our language, guide our walk, guide our communications. And it will be, you know, sometimes if you sound, it sounds silly coming out of your mouth, something that you might say, right? Or an example that you might use. But here this verse tells us, in the last part of it, even sounding the profound and bottomless things of God, the divine counsels and the things hidden and beyond man's scrutiny. We, you may not ever understand it, right? Your neighbor may not ever understand it, or the person sitting next to you may not understand it if you're going uh, two by two to do your witnessing. But God knows what the plan is. God knows what they need, and God knows how to bring it to pass. Amen? Because nothing returns void that the Lord sets out and has foreordained. And here, that reminds us of the supernatural, you know, above and beyond man's scrutiny, beyond man's purview, right? beyond man's ability to understand it. Right? Uh, lean not on your own understanding, right? but in all your ways. Trust in the Lord and his message. So here we can we can know that we can know that we can know that yes, some people that it was not intended for may not understand it. But the person to whom you're speaking, the, the foreordained opportunity for witnessing will understand it. You may have been reaching in somewhere that, that maybe they didn't even understand in that moment somewhere deep in their subconscious because the holy spirit god the father god the son knew what language what word what example to use to reach them amen amen and verse 11 for what person perceives knows and understands what passes through the mind what passes through man's thoughts except for the man's own spirit within him. It's precisely what we've been saying. Just so no one discerns, comes to know, and comprehend the thoughts of God, except the spirit of God. So again, it is paramount that we walk with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit alone knows the thoughts of the Father and the Son, and what that individual that you're witnessing to or preaching with or teaching with may need to hear. Verse 12. Now we have not received the spirit that belongs to the world. You know, again, going back to the last, the first part, we want to eliminate, reduce however we can the influence of the world, our own fleshly desires, our own, you know, jealousies and, uh, bitterness or unforgiveness, we want to remove all those things so that we are allowing the Holy Spirit to dwell in us, first and foremost, right? And then to 
speak and prompt through us. Now we have not received the spirit that belongs to the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God given to us that we might realize and comprehend, realize and comprehend and appreciate the gifts of divine favor, blessings, and so freely and lavishly bestowed on us by God. And we are setting these truths forth in words, not taught by human wisdom. Or he, you know, John is just, uh, uh, Paul is just driving this message home. It is not by human wisdom. It is not under our own power, right? But taught by the Holy Spirit, combining and interpreting spiritual truths with spiritual language to those who possess the Holy Spirit. But the natural, and we talked about this a few moments ago, the natural, non-spiritual man does not accept or welcome or admit into his own heart the gifts and teachings and revelations of the Spirit of God. For they are folly to him or nonsense to him. And he is incapable of knowing them, of progressively even recognizing and understanding and becoming better acquainted with them because they are spiritually discerned and estimated and appreciated. I just, I can't say it, of course, any better than what Paul has just said. And verse 15, but the spiritual man tries all things he examines, investigates, inquires into, questions, and discerns all things, yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. What does that really mean? What is that really saying? You can't be confounded by the follies of, of quote unquote mere men, right? By the worldly attitudes. Uh, if, it, if, if, they, if it was not an ordained situation and that person was not ready to receive the word, it was probably because um, maybe you acted out on your own, right? Or, or as it says here, they simply were a non-spiritual person, not accepting or welcoming or even admitting into their own hearts the gifts and teachings. You know, it just, it just amazes me how many times a person can see, uh, you know, all the, all the, how the world speaks of God and his creation, you know, the sun, the moon, the stars hang in place, the waters are held, you know, the fires are held, all of, you know, it could be, if there, if God was not in control, we would really be in chaos, amen, you know, the mountains could be doing their own things, tornadoes and earthquakes and all these others could be, could, could be all out of control, all acting willy-nilly, and yet, and, and yet, all of it is being held into place. And then, and then the scientists. Remember, I I believe in science to a degree, to a certain extent. Um, many scientists who are atheists will only want to see the world from the from the perspective that there is no creator. You know, if you're already uh, getting into the conversation by denying the creator then obviously you've eliminated all the other all the other potential explanations, right? Which really goes uh, counter to what science is supposed to be for. Well, this study has gone for a little while, so I know that you might be getting a little wary, um, but we'll pick up from here uh, on the next section. And so then we will continue with part to as we pick up on the spirit and our soul, our heart and consciousness, 
the spirit and flesh. I think we've covered that pretty much. Um, your body as a temple where the Holy Spirit can dwell. Um, and I think obedience we've touched on as well. So in the next section, part three, we will go ahead and just advance there and speak about the work of the Holy Spirit. So until then, may God add a blessing to those who have heard and studied the word. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. Shalom.